What you needed at the break was a good cup of coffee. There are two movements in this period which are really quite important. One is the evolution, the intellectual evolution occurring with the thinking of John Locke. Now, I'm going to mention Locke first because what you have is the rationalistic empirical thinking of John Locke and at the same time a highly emotional, highly charged, very devout religious people and I'm going to focus not on the Anglicans but on the Protestants. But first I want you to look and at a few of the ideas that John Locke was advancing. And you'll see them in a moment as soon as I move this over here. All right, can we turn on the screen now and look at the... Yeah, it's working. Let me just move this over because I've got to be able to project the screen. There's a wonderful 18th century phrase by the Scottish poet Robert Burns, who said, the best laid plans of mice and men gang after glay. They often go astray. And I'm just trying to get this position so I can move it. John Locke, in his essay concerning human understanding, published in 1671, well, he, he conceived it in 1671. He actually published it in 1690 and revised it in 1704. Locke's basic theory was that man is born as a tabula rasa, as a blank page. And you fill in this page as you begin to grow. The page assumes, number one, that there are no innate ideas. Now, Locke never conceived that this idea could undermine the d belief in divinity or the belief in God, but he was thinking about human ideas. And he says, man is born as a blank page, and this page fills up through experience. He says, we learn about objects, and we learn by virtue of understanding certain basic principles. Whenever we see a thing, and this is how we learn by looking at so-called things, we can tell what they are by extension, shape, motion, gravity, and rest. For example, uh, here is a pen. Now, this pen has a certain extension to it. It has a certain shape. No one's going to say, give me my no your notebook when I'm holding this up. It has, the monitor is still there, good. It has a, uh, a certain motion. It can move in a certain direction when you're working with it. It has a certain gravity, it goes to the ground, and when it is at rest, it acts in a certain way. <clears throat> Locke says that you understand all these characteristics by your senses. And your senses are paramount in Locke. Everything you know, you, you know by your senses. And this is what we call sensationalist theory. The sensationalist theory is essentially paramount for all knowledge. 
Locke says you take this knowledge of things and you develop an idea. For example, the idea of a chair. Now, this is a chair. Now, how do you know it's a chair? You're not sitting on a chair like this. You don't sit on a chair like this at home. And yet, chairiness is an idea. It has a certain extension, a certain shape, a certain degree of gravity, a certain motion. And when it's at rest, you can tell what chairiness is. Now, it's very important to know what things are and to identify them by your senses, because then you can name them. And a chair in English is chair, and in French it's chaise. What is it in Spanish? Silla. Yeah. And the other languages, what is it in Russian? Any Russians? Any other languages here? All right. <clears throat> in Hebrew, it is kise. In French, it's chaise. In Spanish, it's silla. It doesn't matter what language you're using. It's the same idea. And it's the same figure and the same shape and the same contour and the same form. People say, why is it that we cannot train illiterates to read in America, but any foreigner who comes over can learn quickly? Well, the reason you have to understand is that learning has to do with knowledge. And if a foreigner comes over and knows the word for share in his language, the transference is just the name. It's not the idea or the concept. But people who are illiterate don't even have the concept. And so Locke is very important. Locke also says there are no abstract ideas. And you have to agree with them. Is there, can you conceive of any idea that is abstract? Give me an abstract idea, and I'll prove to you it's not abstract. God. All right. First of all, God is a rather important term, but you've identified a three graphemic symbol, G-O-D, as being a way of understanding the deity. So number one, most people understand the concept by seeing a graphemic transcription, the actual letters written, right? Number two, someone has told you about this. You've listened to preachers, you've listened to ministers, you've listened to your parents. When Christmas has come around and you've looked at a Christmas tree, you've seen a crash, your parents have said, well, there is the baby Jesus. That is the mortal form of God. And so, through very physical ways, through very sensational ways, you have learned what has come to you to be an idea by seeing things, by identifying things. Uh, I would say that if you want to, in the, if the 18th century wanted to prove the existence of God, they would say, Look at nature. Who can create a tree? Who can make it so perfect? Who can create a human being? Who can make it so perfect? Human beings can't do That's the whole story of Frankenstein. So that the idea is transmitted to most people through physical forms, through the things that they are taught and through the forms that, to which they are introduced. And that's a very, very important part of Lockean psychology. Your perception becomes your entrance into knowledge. And belief, to some extent, comes into knowledge. But remember, Locke is talking, he has an essay on human knowledge. He's not talking about our knowledge of God. He would never have accepted the premise I'm saying now, that, there's, that, that an abstraction can't be perceived. By the way, one of the great questions in the 18th century 
was answered by Bishop Barclay, who said, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is there to see it fall or hear it fall, has it fallen? And the answer is obvious. Man takes all these sensational objects, pulls them together into an associational matrix, and he does it by virtue of his soul. Well, if man can organize his ideas and his, pre his figure, his sights, and his, his sensations and his environment through his soul, then a higher soul can see everything. So if the tree fell and we didn't see it, someone did see it. And that's someone, according to Bishop Barbie, meaning God. So that there's a way of translating that whole theory into both a human understanding and a religious understanding. But, but what Locke is concerned about is the essay on human understanding. He's not trying to get into teleological or theological issues. He's concerned about ontology, the nature of one's being here. And so when you try to transpose this into religious issues, you're moving beyond what he thought necessarily was the premise of his belief. Let's move on and see what else he believes. Let's go back to this. And what I'm going to try to do is move this up. Okay. Now, Locke wrote the essay on concerning human understanding. He also wrote letters concerning toleration. In these letters concerning toleration, he defends individual ideas. And this was written in 1689 and 1692 letters on toleration. He defends individual ideas. He believes in full religious toleration. He believes that you should let the dissenters and the Inklings live alive uh, together. Except there's no toleration for Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics in the 18th century were viewed the way communists were viewed by our country for years. And there's no toleration for atheists because atheists don't believe and Roman Catholics uh, give you trappings that deceive you, according to uh, Locke. But his essay on toleration is one of the very important treatises in the world on the changing sensibility and the movement from religious wars to rational behavior. He also wrote in 1690 two treatises on government in which he claimed that society, he believed in the social contract that Hobbes stated that there is a social contract, a contract between your king, let's move down and get that on, on this tape here. He believed in the social contract, that there was a contract between man and his God. There was a contract between your ruler and God and the ruler and the people. It's what we call a double social contract. Not only, that is, the divine right of kings, which Locke did not believe, said that the king gained his authority from God and could rule almost alone. The double contract theory says the king receives authority from God, but he has an obligation also to respect the authority of the people. And so you have a double contract theory. Locke said that the government's purpose is the defense of property, and he, in his essay, separated the executive and the legislative. Now, it's very interesting what this means. From Locke's time until the 1960s in America, everyone who was held for trial or was involved in litigation could be let out on bail 
on the condition that he had property that could be forfeited if he absconded. But in the 60s, when you had the liberal movement and you had the uh, <coughs> movement which essentially exemplified liberal rights, we moved to the right of a person's individual cognizance. And under individual cognizance, a person can get out, even if he doesn't own property, but on his cognizance, on his own cognizance, and on his ability to stay or on his trust. So that Locke's theory lasted in this country until the 60s. The 60s brought about a social revolution, which uh, you know, obviously we have benefited from today. The separation of the executive and the legislative was Lockean. And in 1688, as I said, Locke wrote the Constitution and the bylaws for the Constitution of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of the State of Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And that's the first Bill of Rights in the history of the world. And Locke's theory is monumental. There's no question how important this is, and important in setting up rationalistic ideas. Locke, in his two treatises on government in 1690, attacked the theory of the divine right of kings. And he was answering a book by Robert Filmer called Patriarcha, or the Natural Power of Kings. But the divine right of kings already was being assailed in the 18th century by Locke and Locke's theories. Incidentally, don't let anyone, by the way, ever tell you that Charles should not be the future king of England. He's having all these problems. He's, he's right in a handsome tradition. I mean, Charles II, when he came to the throne in 1660, had a wife, and he had a child who was born to her, probably illegitimately. And when he came to England, the papers which declared their marriage somehow disappeared. And then the rest of his life, Charles, unfortunately, had to marry a, a woman who was barren. And so he had about another half dozen children by other wives. So King, Prince Charles is, is in a handsome tradition. He's fulfilling all the requirements to be king of England. Immorality, lasciviousness, adultery, uh, illegitimacy perhaps, and uh, all the other. I mean, he, he's exactly the kind of person who should come to the throne. There's nothing, there's nothing that's happened to kings of England before him that should abrogate his 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 uh, ability. 1680, right. Uh, he also, Locke wrote a very important treatise on some thoughts concerning education. Locke, by the way, was the person who, cons who helped people understand that if they indeed mapped out a person's education properly, then the child would grow, out, grow up to be the kind of individual society desired. And Locke, in his essays on education, was the first one to express the idea of semiotics. He said, a word is like a seam, a seed. And, se and we're in the study of semiotics uses words as seeds for interpretation. So Locke, in his essay of education, uses the idea of semiotics. He didn't like the idea of whipping in the schools. He said you should whip youngsters only as a last resort. He said the purpose of school is to develop good habits and constructive attitudes. And he was also very modern. He said we should not only teach classical education, we should teach modern education. We should not only teach classical books, we should teach modern books. So there's a lot that you find in John Locke which is really quite impressive and uh, worth looking at. Now, in addition to Locke, I want to look at some of the religious thinking going on in this period. Let me move this out now.
keep this on screen. I'll bring up the other slide in a moment. Has it moved over on the screen? Oh, good. Richard Baxter is a dissenting minister who wrote a book called The Christian Directory, which was published in 1673. Now, Baxter is not atypical, but he is not exactly typical of the types of people who... Uh, were expressing religious views in the 18th century. Baxter lived from 1615 to 1691. So he was alive when John Bunyan was in jail writing Pilgrim's Progress. He was the pastor of Kittermaster, a, a section and uh, he was the author of about 128 works which influenced all kinds of religious thought and he certainly influenced Daniel Defoe who wrote Maul Flanders, and we'll talk about it in a, few, in a few moments. In uh, Baxter was preaching in Kittermaster in the 17th century when he was barred from preaching in a, uh, 1675. Excuse me, I've got that wrong there. Let's see if I get that wrong. All right. Before, before he was barred from preaching, he was jailed in 60, from October 20th, 1662, until his release on November 24th, 1686. Uh, for some four years, he sat in jail because he was a minister and he wanted to preach at his parish. In 1675 and 1776, he wasn't able to preach. His wife, who had a lot of property, bought two homes next to each other and actually built a church for him so he could preach secretly. But the church was raided the first day he preached. So that enterprise ended. But you have to say something good about Baxter's wife. In 1687, James II who was Roman Catholic, declared a declaration of indulgence which gave the license to preach to all kinds of people. And a, uh, Baxter then preached until his death in 1691. Now, what are some of the things that he was preaching about? Give you a list in just a moment. This will work a little better next time since we figure out what the bugs are. Okay, here we are. Okay. <laughs> 
adultery, anger, backsliding, catechism. He preached on the behavior of children. He spoke about the conjugal duties of husbands and wives to each other. He spoke about the creatures of the world, the problem of despair, the nature of the devil. Divorce and separation, drunkenness, duties of husbands to wives, duties of parents to children, Duties of children toward parents, this is all in the Christian directory. It's about a thousand pages long. I'm not asking you to read that. Duties of servants, duties of masters toward servants, the education of children, family worship, filthy, ribald, and scurrilous talk. We would have seen his review on Pulp Fiction. Listen. Too much, too much, too much. Uh, frivolous conduct, the nature of God, this goes alphabetically, by the way, holy government of families, hypocrisy, idleness, knowledge, the Lord's prayer, ministers, mirth and pleasure, order, passions, prayer, the nature of redemption, how to celebrate the Sabbath day, scorners, servants, slavery, the son swearing and taking gods in name and it keeps going down to the time of prayer, schism, the trinity, woman, and worship of God. Incidentally, he was worried about crime in the period. And I'll show you, uh, this is actually 70, this is actually 60 years later, but it's the 18th century. This is Hogarth's uh, The Four Stages of Cruelty. The Four Stages of Cruelty. These are teenage gangs who are mutilating animals. Notice this one is running the arrow into the dog. This one has thrown two cats over a pole with their tails tied together. This one is tying a dog's bone to his tail so the dog will chase himself around. But these are teenage gangs and uh, they're mutilating animals. So there's nothing new when they talk about gangs. The second stage of cruelty shows, I mean, Baxter's concerned about human behavior. This is also from Hogarth in the 1730s. It shows a drayman, a teamster, who is beating his horse as the carriage is thrown over. And this teamster is drunk and asleep while wine is spilling out of the barrel. And his wheels are, with spokes in them are about to, spikes in them are about to run over this innocent child playing, and he's oblivious of them. So there are automobile accidents in the 18th century. There are Motors dying in the middle of the highway. That's one horsepower. Drunk Pardon me? Drunk driving. Drunk driving. Right. These are some of the things you're concerned about. The third stage of cruelty. has a scene in which this, this gentleman whom you've seen first mistreating the animals and now beating his horse is shown in the graveyard courtyard having uh, killed a woman with a knife 
Her throat is slit open. You can see the gorge in the throat. And her hand has been chopped, almost chopped off. And so there's mutilation of women and crimes against women in the 18th century. And for some reason, I don't have that slide here. And the fourth stage shows what happens to criminals when they are sentenced to death. They become corpses in medical schools where students can study their anatomy. And if you notice this, what's happening to the criminal's heart? The dog is eating it. So that's what happens in the, this is the reward of cruelty. But Baxter's concern. Now, Baxter had a diff had not, wasn't entirely without motivation. His problem was how to describe the way people should behave, how to describe the way people should behave while accommodating the nature of the world. That is, you can tell someone that he shouldn't get drunk. But maybe you shouldn't tell them not to drink. Maybe you should just tell them to drink in moderation. Because Baxter was amongst those Puritan divines who were pragmatists, or we would call them casuists, C-A-S-U-I-S-T-S. -S. Their job was to find a way to accommodate religion to human behavior. You see, before this period, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to find easy transitions and cutoff points, but if you were impious, if you were a sinner, you would be punished and you would experience the wrath of God. However, once you understand that individuals react differently, once you understand that there's an individuation, once you realize that people can be taught and can be taught incrementally, once you realize that each person has to be involved individually, then you can come up with laws that condemn people arbitrarily in general. You've got to find ways to accommodate reality. And so even the religionists of this period were looking for ways to accommodate reality. And let me read to you a few of the things that Baxter says in the Christian directory where he describes all these events. He says, what if men go or trade beyond the sea or in another land and leave their wives behind them? Even though they have their wives' consent, it is an unlawful course except in mere necessity or public service or when they are unable on good grounds to say that the benefits are likely to be greater than the soul and the body lost. He knows that if you go to sea, and if you're away for two years from your wife, that the inclination is that you're going to meet a native or you're going to meet another woman, you're going to have an affair, and then you're going to uh, uh, commit adultery. And so he says, try not to be away from home. If you have to go, just remember that you're going to risk the soul and the body, and you will suffer a loss on the assumption that relationships will will lead. He says, uh, the offices of the member, he says, the, the husband and wife are bound to perform for one another a cohabitation. Like the offices of the body, one member to each other. You cannot separate your arms from your body, nor should you separate a husband from a wife. But he says, if this husband is going to be gone for two years, you know something's going to happen. It's going to be a loss. He doesn't say divorce her, divorce him. He says there's going to be a loss. So there's a very interesting psychological approximation here. He's saying there are exigencies, and you have to understand them, and you can't arbitrate against them. Uh, he says, does adultery dissolve the bond 
of marriage or not. He says, it is, fornication is not lawful, but if husband and wife continue their conjugal familiarity after adultery, the bond is not dissolved. He says, try to make accommodations. Try to learn to live with each other. Try to accept temptations. This is a pragmatic point of view. You won't see it on the Oprah Winfrey show. That woman will berate her man and she'll kick him and, she'll, and he'll berate her for her vengeance against him and you know this is going to break up. In the meantime, it's all been scripted very well. Half those people are very good Hollywood actors. Okay. He says another thing in terms of adultery. He says, I see no reason to blame those countries whose laws allow the wife to sue for divorce as well as the husband. So apparently in England you could not, the wife didn't have the privilege of suing. But there are a, oriental countries and we get reports from other countries where the wife had greater privileges. Uh, and certainly in Indian, in American Indian communities, the wife had far greater privileges than the, the, the uh, settler wives as we know from Indian captivity tales. These are pragmatics of work. He has laws and backslide. I want to move into just a few of these ideas just to show that there was good sense in this religious belief. Because people were deep religionists didn't mean that they didn't understand human psychology and they were able to make accommodations to reality. He says, how about attitudes of education? He says, let me seriously speak to the hearts of those who are those careless and ungodly parents who neglect the holy education of their children. And even to clergymen of godliness who flubber over so great a work but omit practicing it. He says, Make not your children like your beasts and don't make a provision for them only for their flesh. There was an interesting problem in sla uh, Oh, let's look at the uh, filthy, ribald, and scurrilous talk. Remember that filthy talk is but the approach to filthy acts. It is breaking the shell of modesty this is the tendency, whether you intend it or not. And the second thing about swearing all the time and using vulgar language is that you weary the hearers. They get tired of you. And it's no longer an effect, you see. That you should swear only for once or twice just for effect, but after that, you get tiresome. Which is my final statement on Pulp Fiction. These people had a problem with slavery. A lot of Quakers, a lot of dissenters were slaveholders. They had a problem with slavery because they were told that if they were good Christians and they had slaves, they were supposed to free them in seven years. Now that's a pretty sensible thing to do and a pretty reasonable thing to do unless you only think of your slave as property. And a slave in the 8th, 17th century could be valued at anywhere from $72,000 in modern dollars to $75,000. That is, having a slave was a tantamount to owning an automobile or an expensive automobile, like a Rolls Royce. If you had a, if you had a male slave whom you bought at auction for 100% of the price, you had a Rolls Royce. And who's going to give up his Rolls Royce? 
By the way, women as slaves were sold at 67% of the men, and the uh, children at 70, uh, young teenagers at 75% of a male, and that's the first auction. The second part of the auction where you get weaker people, the price is lower. This, by the way, the fellow who won the Nobel Prize for economics two years, uh, two years ago did it on the premise of studying slave auctions. Well, you see, the problem is if you own 10 slaves, you have a great deal of wealth, and you don't want to lose it. So how do you reconcile your religious belief against your slaveholding belief? That's the real problem. One of the ways they solved the problem was to convert the, to convert the slaves, but not to give them freedom. And the way they did it was by telling the slave, you will be converted, but I will determine when you leave. So the slave was literally baptized, but not free. This is a casuistic response. By the way, the only ones who, were, who held to their beliefs for the most part, at least in the Barbados, were the Quakers. The Quakers would invite slaves to their churches and England was so incensed by it in the 1630 or 40 that they passed a law saying that any slaves found in church would be confiscated and divided among the other slaveholders whose slaves did not go to church. So the Quakers had themselves a problem in the 17th century. Well, you have to understand that there are very severe religious problems. And in this climate, in this climate of severe religious problems, the person whose book seems to have endured over the centuries is John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Now, let me mention to you a few things about Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to be using the screen anymore. Thank you. Right. Well, you have me, right? Oh, you don't even have me. Well. What you have is my voice. So at least one of your senses is accommodating reality, even if the others are not. Excuse me for one moment. Just a few details I'll call to mind, and so you have them. Bunyan was born in 1628. In 1644, he served in the army. He actually fought the Civil Wars, and he fought, of course, on the side of Oliver Cromwell, on the side of the Puritans. In 1647, he became a tinker. He made metal goods. And in 1648, he married a woman who gave him two books, two religious books, as her diary. They had four children, two years apart, 1650, 1654, 1660, 1666, and 1658. He joined in 1655 the Bedford Separatist Church, a Separatist Church which was Baptist. And he began to preach as a layman at the Bedford Church. His wife died in 1658, and he married again in 1659. And in 1660, he was in prison for his preaching. And he stayed in prison for 12 years, from 1660 to 1672. He was allowed to leave prison for visits from time to time but he preached to his fellow prisoners. He was released from prison in 1672 when the king issued the Declaration of Indulgence, but he was in prison a second time after the Test Act was enforced in 1673. He was imprisoned in 1677 when he began to write Pilgrim's Progress. He died in London in 1688 when William was coming to the throne of England at the end of James II's 
Now, why didn't he, why did he go to jail? Samuel Pepys tells of seeing thousands of dissenters in chains being led to jail because they refused not to preach. There are other acts passed. There was the Ten Mile Conventicle Act and the Five Mile Conventicle Act, acts which said that preachers whom people didn't want to preach were not allowed to preach within five, year, five miles of the place where they used to preach or ten miles within the place they used to preach. Very, very hard laws, very harsh laws, because the Anglican Church, the, cons the, 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 uh, the churchmen were assured that they were right, that they wanted to put down dissent, they wanted the king to put down dissent, and they would do everything they can to oppress these three million dissenters who stayed in England. So it's an ambivalence. Notice, at the time that we have this growing interest in toleration, this growing expression, growing out of this oppression, we have the oppression ever so insurmountable. And a uh, Locke, of course, coming out of this and writing his treatises, 1685, 1688, 1690, when the transition, when the people are really getting fed up with the Roman Catholic James II, and looking to the Netherlands to bring in William and Mary, we have this ambivalent society in which there's growing toleration in the age of rationalism, in the Enlightenment. At the same time, there are religionists trying to hold on to uh, the most orthodox and uh, oppressive ideas, and there are people who are pragmatists in the middle trying to figure out a way to accommodate the differences between the orthodoxy and the modern religion between their God and their individuality. So you can never under underestimate the, the, the very vigorous and the almost intellectually stimulating climate that was both welcome and fearful to so many people living at the time. Now at this point I'd like to move on to talk about the novel that you're going to be reading. We're going to spend more time with it next week. And that is Pilgrim's Progress. By the way, you know, we certainly can invite your questions, and if there are people at Northwestern, North Houston Institute or West Houston Institute who want to say something, I think you press the microphone in front of you and say hello. Are there anyone, is there anyone there? We have any voices? Let's talk for a few moments about Pilgrim's Progress, this story that uh, uh, John Bunyan wrote in prison. It's a story of man's progress through life to heaven and hell, how he gets there and what he does whether he, when he's in this world alone. Bunyan says he lay down asleep one night and dreamed of a man whom he saw standing in a field crying in pain because he and his whole family were going to be destroyed. And Bunyan tells us his name is Christian. He knows he's going to be destroyed, and all people know that they're eventually going to die, and this, of course, is the equation. Evangelist, a preacher of Christianity, soon comes to Christian and gives him a roll of paper where he finds written the idea that he should flee from the wrath of God. He should flee from the city of destruction, 
and he should go to the city of Zion. The scroll could be the Holy Scrolls. It could be some manuscript of some uh, religious content. Christian runs home with this scroll. He wants to get his neighbors and his family to go with him on this trip he must take. But they won't leave. He, they think he's mad, ill. And he feels that the only way he can find his salvation is to leave us on his own. So uh, leaving his family, and leaving his friends, leaving his neighbors, he goes on this trip. Now, I've been talking to you about the realistic novel, and I've been talking about religious point of view, religious points of view, and now here I am talking to you about a novel that seems to be unrealistic, that seems to be a dream, and that has allegorical characters such as Christian, who represents his society, and is this not real, right? This is an allegorical novel. It's a transitional novel. Because while the characters are not real, while the characters are allegorized, while the characters don't seem to be people whom you have met, I mean people whom you have met generically, they become very, very human beings. And the nature of good allegory is to put across general truths in a realistic way. And this allegory is like nothing you've ever seen before. It is really a psychological drama. It's really a psychological drama of human existence with characters who become believable because they characterize every person. Now, after we read Pilgrim's Progress, then you're going to move on to Maul Flanders and see how a singular individual in the realistic novel carries out what thematically is the nature of existence. One is always looking for one's salvation. That's the important thing to people in the 18th century, looking for one's salvation. By the way, I think there are certainly as many religious people in the 20th century as there were in the 18th century, more so. As many superstitious people as there were in the 18th century. And probably as many people in the 18th century as in the 20th who don't even care about salvation or their soul or their future. That's why they're willing to shoot people and kill people and that's why you have drive-by shootings because the people who carry this out have never been ingrained with the idea that there's something ahead of for them. Life becomes only a life for Christian's family was an immediate existence. Somehow how one has to understand, according to this literature, that there is a future and that one must prepare for it. And this, of course, is John Bunyan's point of view. Uh, and, of course, what I'm giving you is, is what I think is a good approach to this novel. I'm not necessarily giving you my belief. I'm not giving you anyone else's belief. I am trying to focus on what Bunyan was saying here, who he was when he wrote this. He was not a guy with his head in the sky. He wasn't a dreamer. He was a tinker who wanted to preach and who found himself oppressed by his society. He was a human being who translated his experience and his belief into an allegory where he takes allegorical figures and makes them human, which is what allegor allegory does here. It's what we call personified allegory, where the allegory becomes human in its nature. What does Christian do? Along the way, he meets various people. He meets pliant and obstinate. Pliant are people who will do anything no matter what happens. Obstinate people will do nothing no matter what happens. And you find them in your society. One of them is your boss, probably. If he's pliant, then he's too pliant with other people. If he's obstinate, he won't give you a raise. 
but you will meet pliant and obstinate. You will meet people who uh, will not go to religious services and some who will go because their boyfriends go or their girlfriends go or their parents go or their, their uh, buddies go or don't go or they won't go. Be they're compliant or they're pliable. And so you find these people in society. Now, Christian along the way with in the presence of pliant and obstinate, falls into the slow of despond, S-L-O-U-G-H, like, a, like a, a mire. He's so despondent, he doesn't know, they don't help him, and yet he's trying to look for salvation, he's trying to move to the city of Zion, and they're not going very well with him, he's not going with them. He gets out of the slow of despond, Finally, when he meets Mr. Worldly Wise Men, who tries to convince him that he's going to have a happier time if he gives up this trip, if he, if he settles down, if he gets into town life. Mr. Worldly Wise Men. Mr. Worldly Wise Men is the one who buys at Ikea. You see, you're going to buy low-priced goods, and you're going to make yourself a nice home at little expense, and you're going to get along in this world, and you're not going to spend $10 on the lottery. You can spend a dollar hoping you'll win, but you're not going to burden your family with, with the lottery. And uh, if you have a choice of a, uh, watching the football games on Sunday or doing something religious, you uh, will take that choice. You may, if you're a worldly wise man and you have a good bet on the game, watch the game. Or you may go to church and pray that your bet on the game will win for you. But in some ways, you will express the ways of the world. But following worldly wise men is not going to get Christian very far ahead. Soon Christian arrives at a closed gate. And there he meets goodwill who tells them if he knocks on it, it'll open. Opportunity opens if you show goodwill. And this is a man whom you wish to accompany. Christian goes into the gatekeeper's house, and there he meets interpreter. And there he finds many of the interpretations of life. If you have goodwill, and if you want to study, you'll find your way to study. You see? in interpreter's home. He sees pictures of Christ and passion and patience. He sees despair in a cage of iron bars. And Christian is filled with hope. And so he goes on his journey and he finally reaches a place where he sees the Holy Cross and the sepulcher of Christ. And there his burdens fall off him. And he feels that he's now on his way to salvation. Notice he hasn't reached that. By accepting this vision, by accepting this belief, he's ready to move on now. Now he's been reinvigorated. He has been reborn. By the way, it's quite an experience to get to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and see what's there, see who's protecting it, see how many people are thinking like Christian does from the, amongst the Armenians, among the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, amongst the Roman Catholics, amongst the Protestant faiths. It's a, uh, still, there are a lot of differences. You think that having had this experience of being rebirth, he's going to be all right. But don't forget that this is mortal man on his way to the journey, his pilgrimage. And man, according to Hobbes, is subject to passions that will overwhelm him. And whom does Christian meet where he thinks he's safest? He's been to the Holy Sepulchre. 
what can prevent him from reaching salvation? Well, along the way he meets sloth, simple, presumption, hypocrisy. And if he follows their advice, then of course the, salva the, the hope he had achieved will force him again into despair. He lies down to sleep for a while and wakes up and forgets to pick up the roll of paper evangelist gave him. And why does he forget? Obviously, if you're a psychologist, you know. Get into a habit of sloth and hypocrisy, laziness, despair, simplistic thinking, and whatever is on paper will be meaningless to you and you'll forget it. And so what happens? Running back, he finds himself near a gate with two lions. And he's afraid to go past them. Well, if animals are going to detain you, these lions don't represent real lions. They are lions but they represent the fears that one accommodates, the fears one adopts. Krishna is invited into the home of the, of the place where the lions were chained, and the porter greets him and shows him relics of biblical antiquity. And there he meets four virgins, discretion, prudence, piety, and charity. Discretion, prudence, piety, and charity. They give him good advice, and they send him on his way. In the Valley of Humiliation, he meets Apollyon. Can we have a picture on this down here on the screen? Pardon me? Um... Can we turn on the visual? Oh, it's off altogether. It's on my screen here. OK, here you are. Those of you who have the book in front of you, this is the Penguin Classic, by the way. $2.50 American. Oh, this was when I bought it. <laughs> it might be $8 right now. In the Valley of Humiliation, Christian meets a giant devil, Apollyon, whose body is covered with shiny scales. Christian is wounded, but after he chases away the devil, his wounds heal with leaves from the tree of life. And he's able... Uh, he finds himself coming to the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And he has to pass by the gates of hell to save himself from this devil. As he moves along, he meets other dangers. He goes by the caves of old giants. Who are those old giants? Pope and pagan. Right? Sound familiar? And then he finds himself in Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair is a town which traps all people. Houston's Vanity Fair. Those of you who have come from small towns in Texas, from El Campo, Bay City, and you told people you're coming to Houston, the city of iniquity, the city of Vanity Fair, they know you're lost. And when Christian comes to Vanity Fair, the first thing he's going to do is go to Galleria <laughs> and buy everything he can because that becomes more important to him than everything else. Or he'll get on a bus and go to the Cachada Gambling Resort in Louisiana. But he's going to be seduced by the Vanity Fair. <laughs> 
However, he meets several friends who are arrested because they will buy none of these goods. They will not be tempted by Vanity Fair. And so the authorities say that you are violating the principles and the, the charter of the city. Among the people who is arrested is Faithful, who is sentenced to be burned alive while Krishna is put in prison. And when Faithful dies in the fire, a chariot comes down from heaven and takes him up to God. Krishna escapes from prison, and with a young man by the name of Hopeful, he moves on to uh, this salvation. But along the way, they are trapped in Doubting Castle. Doubts arise in his mind. And he is trapped by the giant of Doubting Castle with his wife. We'll talk about that next week. Now all I'm doing is giving you a bare bones outline. Because what we're really doing is getting into multiple personality analysis in Pilgrim's Progress. You're going to find out what Hopeful says and what Despair says, what Apollyon says, what Christian says, what Faithful says, what Despair says, what the giant says to his wife in bed when they're trying to figure out how to handle Hopeful and Christian. But Christian finds a key that he has forgotten called promise. And this key he is going to be able to turn and get out of the Doubting Castle. Ultimately, Pilgrim is going to cross the river of death and find himself at the gates of heaven. Now, the principles in this story are basically these. Number one, you have a unified plot. You have circumvention of the original goals that were going to be achieved. You have temptations set in the way. You have frustrations. And you have finally goals achieved. Now, Pilgrim's Progress is one type of novel. And I'm going to call it a novel. But it's better called an allegory because it does not fit the strictures of the novel as I laid them out at the beginning of this session. One of the things you're going to find out, though, is that the novel is a very tricky form. It's amorphous. At the time we're beginning to study the novel, it wasn't shaped very well. It wasn't shaped very well. It wasn't shaped at all. And so you have allegory we can call somewhat of a novel. You have Maul Flanders, which is the adventures of a woman who finds herself involved in the economics of necessity. We're going to call that a novel. We're going to call Tristram Shandy, which is a Lockean psychological analysis of a man trying to figure out his own life. And it's really quite odd in the way it's done. It doesn't follow any time. It doesn't follow anything near the time sequence that you would expect. We're going to look at Ivanhoe, which is a medieval romance. We're going to look at Redburn, which is a, and then we're going to look at Stendhal's The Red and the Black which is an ironic tale. There's not a page in it that isn't steeped in irony and invective and a morbid attack on humans, human people's motivations. And then in the 20th century, we're going to look at three voices. The voice of Gertrude Stein in Ida, who gives us a woman who is experiencing life through World War I and into World War II and speaking in a minimalist way as Picasso and Mondrian, her friends, painted in a minimalist way. But Ida gives us the voice of one woman trying to get along in this world with her dogs, with her husbands, with her jobs, with her discoveries, with her disappointments. Then we're going to move on to Leaving Cheyenne by Larry McMurtry. And listen to three voices. Molly, the woman, and two of her three lovers, each of whom talks about her and their relationship. The third lover was her husband, who died in an oil derrick 
accident. And the last voice we're going to listen to is the voice of John Whiteman. Whiteman tells a story of hiding place where a young black man who is really his brother, Whiteman's brother, now in prison for life, who has escaped a crime and who finds himself facing an old black woman whose son was killed in World War II, a gold star mother. One woman has given up on her life because everything's been taken away from her. One man who thought he had a future no longer has a future. And they come together. And out of this despair comes a mutual respect where both lives people hope can be saved. Now John Whiteman, who tells this fictional story of his brother, has told another story of his brother called Brothers and Keepers, which has his, tells his bro the story of his brother in prison. And the two brothers, Whiteman and Oxford, a, a University of Pennsylvania graduate, the leading basketball player in Ivy League Pennsylvania history, Pennsylvania's I Ivy League history, and an Oxford scholar talking to his brother who's in jail for life for participating in the burglary that ended in a murder. Now, we're going to begin with the idea of the way people wrote about the quest for dignity and salvation. And we're going to end with two people's claim for dignity and whatever salvation the 20th century brings. So the novels we're going to focus on are compelling. They're, I chose them. I chose them, let me mention one other reason. Three Nobel Prize winners, Chela, Mafuz, and Agnon, were asked who influenced their lives. Now, Mafuz, Path, and the, uh, uh, Canetti, three Nobel Prize winners, were asked who influenced your writing. And they said Stendhal, Kafka, and Stern. And so I figured we might as well bring in Kent Stendhal, Kafka, and Stern and find out what made them so important as to Nobel Prize winners who read them when they were youngsters. Well, I, I understand there's a little problem with the books. I, I, my, my guess is that the books are at West Houston Institute because they were ordered. And my, uh, my by next week, you should be able to get Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgr Pilgrim's Progress is available in most bookstores and should be easily available. By that time, if the books are not here, the others will start coming in and we'll be doing all right. But what I want you to do is start thinking about what books you would like to write for a critical paper and what books you'd like to write for a research paper. And then we'll a, uh, uh, see this course develop. So we'll get a chance to meet today. It was a little hectic, but thank you for coming. Thank you for being part of the class. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. Can yes, I need your release forms. And is there anyone here who's a work-study student at the university? If there's anyone here who's a work-study student, I need to talk to you too. Okay. Miss Gray, right?